the day by uh, talking about cloud chaos and microservices mayhem. I feel so lucky to be a developer, and I feel extra lucky to be a developer in 2022. Um, Prem mentioned we're a young audience. I am, I am not a young speaker. <laughs> I, I have been around long enough to remember the days before the cloud. Um, and there was a lot of stuff that I had to do as part of my job that wasn't very much fun. I, I used to have a desk, and, and the way you could tell your status as a developer was by how many servers you had on your desk. So I had four servers on my desk, which made me feel really cool. But then I had to keep them all patched. And I had to keep all of the operating systems up to date, and I had to keep all of the software up to date, and I had to keep uninstalling and reinstalling things on them. So actually, a lot of my time was spent just keeping these four servers in the state where I wouldn't get fired for some sort of security violation. So when the, when the cloud came along and we could just provision a server with a push of a button, it was great. So many things that had been really hard became frictionless and delightful. But, of course, it's not all perfect. A lot of us <laughs> and a lot of organizations have, have gone to the cloud and got electrocuted. There, there are hazards in the cloud. There are things that can really catch you out. And as well, although some aspects of my job that I didn't enjoy very much have gone away, other new things have come in that all of a sudden I have to do. So in 2022, there's all these new demands. The first one is 2022. We have to get really good at hand washing. It's practically a full-time job just to try and keep our hands washed. And then, of course, there's our actual day job, app development. But it's not enough to just write the apps and throw them over the wall. This is 2022. We have to have an understanding of the ops side as well. Depending how, how our organizations work, we may even be fully doing the ops for our apps. And of course, if we're doing that, then we're doing DevOps. But the problem with DevOps is when you look at it, you say, DevOps, that sounds really good, but there's something, something missing. What's, what's missing? No security. And it doesn't seem really right that we're getting this unified flow between dev and ops and security are standing in their, you know, in their offices going, but, but wait a minute, we'd like to be part of this party too. Could, could you talk to us before releasing rather than after releasing or the day before you're going to release when you come to us and say, right, so can you, can you approve me for security because I need to go out tomorrow? And they go, but, but, but there's so much of it and why didn't you talk to us earlier? And then there's, there's a whole bunch of other ops as well, because the problem with DevSecOps is something is missing. The business, why are we even doing this? So then you get biz DevSecOps. And then design have said, but, but wait a minute, what about us? And so I don't think you get biz design DevSecOps because that just starts to become too much, but you get design ops, which is really interesting. I won't go through all of those because I'd have to make my font too small. But I do want to mention one more ops that I think is growing in importance um, and we'll be looking at more, and that's FinOps. How many of you have heard of FinOps? About six hands, not, not many. Um, how many of you would say you're actually practicing FinOps? <laughs> no, I have to say I have never seen it in, in, in the wild. Um, but I get, I get quite excited about FinOps. Um, so I'll come back and explain a little bit more about, about what FinOps was, I is. But really, it, it's, the, it's the technique of bringing that, that real-timeness, that automation, that easiness to some of the financial organization, the financial processes of an organization, which I think if any of you have tried to get travel approval or budget approval or understand how much you're spending on anything, you'll know that they, they tend to be about 30, 40, 50, 100 years behind the, the rest of us technologically. 
But the, the thing with the cloud is it makes it all so much easier, which is good. But there's a whole bunch of things that we used to know how to do that we don't know how to do anymore. So tracing, packaging, performance, modularity, they've all changed. And so then all of a sudden our expectations about what good looks like are, are wrong. So I want to just cover, I can't cover everything, but I want to talk about a few things that are different in the cloud. And, and some of you may be thinking, wow, I'm sat in the stairs here and in one of the other rooms I could have had a comfy seat and she's going to tell me about the cloud and we've been doing the cloud for 10 years. I know all about the cloud. And you probably do. Well, in fact, you definitely do. But the thing that I find interesting is that even though we've been doing the cloud for 10, 15 years, it's taken us a long time to catch up to it. So even though as us as individuals are on top of it, a lot of our tools haven't really caught up. A lot of the things that our institutions do, a lot of our processes completely haven't caught up. So even though it is blindingly, blindingly obvious to say technology changes fast, <laughs> like, yeah, duh, it, it actually kind of changes slowly as well because there's this gap between where we are with the technology and everything else sort of desperately hopping to keep up. So I want to start with one of the happy ones. Um, I think this is one where it's taken us a little while, but I think we're in a pretty good state. So we used to talk about tracing. Um, now we talk about observability. And then the people who really understand the definition of observability get really upset and say, tracing is not observability. They're not the same things. Please stop using observability as a trendy buzzword to apply to everything in this area. I'm going to ignore that. I'm just going to use observability as a trendy buzzword to apply to everything in this area because that's what everybody else does. So how, how it used to work is we would have our application and it would be generating some logs. That worked fine. But in the cloud, we, when we started doing the cloud, we continued to do the same thing. But then a bad thing happened and our application, our container died for whatever reason. And so we naively went to get the logs that were on the container that didn't exist anymore. <laughs> but of course, they weren't there either. So I think we've probably all had this experience of trying to debug a failure on a container and then realizing that you can't debug the failure on the container because the logs that tell you why it failed are on the container that isn't there. So what we had to do was we had to externalize our logs. As soon as it generated a log, the second it generated the log, we had to send it somewhere else for safekeeping. But of course, then we had a second problem, which is we didn't just have one container in the cloud. I mean, we, we could do that, but it seemed to be not really taking advantage of the cloud when we could have lots and lots of containers, each with their own logs. And so that meant when we wanted to try and debug something bad that had happened, we didn't just have one set of logs to read through. We had a whole bunch of logs, and we had to try and make some sense of this big spaghetti of logs. So then we really needed some kind of system for doing that tracing, for doing that aggregation, for doing that correlation. We used to do open tracing for this. Open tracing is now fairly deprecated. Um, and we use open telemetry. I think open telemetry, it feels like we're a bit, whoops. Please excuse me while I try and get my. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. So it feels like we're in a bit of a, a golden age for this because. <laughs> I've got on-stage hairstyling support. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Hopefully my hair's not like all like this and we'll have a video forever recording it looking ridiculous. So uh, <laughs> sometimes I think when we, when we work in the digital world, everything goes wrong all the time. And we say, why couldn't I just work with these low-tech analog things where you can physically put it together? But now we have the evidence that even low-tech analog things. Could I have, sorry, the other side? <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
can go wrong. So we have this sort of this, this golden age of things that work with, with open telemetry. I think it's a really good place. And, and I think one of the best things about it is that we have this sort of cross vendor support. So you have that portability and you have that integration and you can make different choices and they all kind of work together. So the good news really is that observability is a, a fixed problem in a sense. We have the solution, we have the standardization, we have the industry alignment. So how many of you are using open telemetry? Yeah, I think I count maybe five hands. So that, how many of you think you should be using open telemetry? Yeah, so that, that's the bad news, is there's this lag between what we think we should be doing, what we know we should be doing, and what we're actually doing. And of course it gets worse, because at least with open telemetry we know what the right answer is. <laughs> for some other things we don't know. Our understanding of what good looks like for performance has really changed with the cloud. It used to be that, in general, what you wanted for something for performance was you would start it up, you wanted it to process as many transactions as possible for about six months until you eventually shut it down. And that was, that was your metric for good. But now in the cloud, all of a sudden we have costs associated with things. So our memory footprint, we can translate directly from that to a dollar sign. Our startup time, we can co translate directly from that to an impact to our user. So it used to be we'd start it up and then six months later we'd shut it down. But now we want to be bringing things up and down quickly and we're paying, not necessarily for every megabyte, but certainly if we have to go up a tier and choose a bigger instance, that's expensive. And there's a whole bunch of things that we used to try and do that we don't need anymore. So now our, our container images are immutable. And I, I used to, um, I work for Red Hat now. I, I work on the Quarkus team. And I used to work for IBM as a consultant in the IBM garage. So some of the stories I'm going to tell you are, are from that. But I also used to work as a developer on the WebSphere application server. And we worked so hard to make that thing dynamic so that you could start it up and you could add capability and remove capability and it could on the fly just sort of change its shape so that it was a completely different application server after six months. But of course we don't want need things to do that now. But all of that dynamism is still baked into a lot of the frameworks that we use. But we don't need it because if you want your application server to change capabilities, you're not going to update the config in the cloud. You're just going to push a new image. And so I used to spend a lot of time talking to people about how ahead of time optimization seemed like a bad idea and actually was, sorry, seemed like a good idea and actually was a bad idea. <laughs> but now it's the opposite. Now, because we have these immutable images, we know the environment in which we're running. So ahead of time optimization makes a lot of sense and we can get some really good savings from that. And so this is what, what Quarkus does in order to support running on a native, as a native image, it does a whole bunch of stuff ahead of time. But the interesting thing is it can also run on the JVM. And all of those optimizations that we do to support native also make it run faster on the JVM, both in terms of its startup time, but also its throughput. It just runs faster at runtime because it's not trying to do all this dynamic stuff. Performance optimization has also changed in the cloud. I heard, I heard a lovely story um, from Martin Verberg of Microsoft. They were trying to debug a performance problem. Now, I, I always used to spend a lot of time, to be say, again, saying I used to work as a performance engineer on garbage collection, and I used to say to people, look, don't worry too much about garbage collection. You're not really going to be hurt by garbage collection. Uh, in this case, they had, they had an application and they couldn't figure out why every single request going in seemed to have really bad latency. It wasn't like the odd request had bad latency. Every single one did. And they eventually worked out what it was, was they had a really long chain of microservices. They, they'd thought, we can make containers easily in the cloud. 
So we should make containers easily in the cloud. We should make as many containers in the cloud as we can and link them all together for every single request because that makes me a cooler developer. So what they did was each request, the request would come in, it would go to a different server, it would go to a different server, it would go to a different server, it would keep going. And a request would pass through about 100 different services. And if you have 100 different Java services linked together, the odds are that at least one of them at the time you hit it is going to be doing garbage collection. So it meant that almost every single request somewhere along its life got hit by a garbage collection pause. So that was a bit sad. But we see other really unexpected things in the cloud. Um, my colleague Ben Evans wrote an article a while ago where he'd sort of gone and actually looked through the code of the JVM, which is something that no one in their right mind does because there's a lot of it. But what he found was really interesting. Because the JVM, it's for, for as long as forever, it's been designed very cleverly so that you don't have to spend a long time trying to tune it unless you're doing something really specialized and weird. The default options are going to work best. And for sure, the default options are definitely going to work better than that big long string of options that you found on the internet when you looked up how should I tune my JVM. There's all this sort of folk wisdom of JVM optimization options and almost all of them were maybe right for someone in 2012, but they're definitely not right for you, and they're not right in 2022. So as part of its ergonomics, it's, it's trying to decide to, how to do the right thing for what it thinks you're trying to do. The JVM will tune itself differently on servers. Which makes sense, you know, you, you're going to want it to, you have different requirements on a server. But the question is, now I have to readjust. What is a server? And there's a sort of an easy answer of like, well, if it's running in a rack in a data center, it's a server. But the J J JVM doesn't have access to that. So yes, it has to. <laughs> it has to guess. And so it guesses by looking around at what it can see. And what it can see is how much memory it has, how much CPU it has. And so Ben looked through and he found the line of code that decides if it's a server. And the line of code is it has more than two physical CPUs and more than two gig of memory. How many of you run your cloud instances smaller than this? A few, right? How many of you run your containers smaller than this? Quite a few, right? Because it's 2022. Memory is, is money. Cores are money. If we can go smaller, we will. So Ben looked to see what kind of decisions the JVM made based on this. And one of the things he found is it tuned the garbage collection differently. So. The blue line is, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. The blue line is what it did in the one CPU case. The orange line is what it did in the two CPU case. And of course, you can't compare exactly because it was able to do more work on the, the two CPU case, case. But you can see that the pauses are like almost 10 times as long in the one CPU case, which almost certainly isn't what you wanted. And so the, the, the moral of the story is that if you shrink your containers too much, all of a sudden the JVM may start making these weird decisions for you that detune your application. So if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that I've given you two completely contradictory sets of advice. I've said it's 2022, CPU is money, you want to make your instances as small as possible. And I've said, whatever you do, don't make your instances too small or your JVM will be start behaving weirdly. So 
This is the chaos part. I find it really interesting. It's 2022, and we still don't actually know what the right answer is for how big should my instance be. We don't even have a heuristic for it. It, it just totally depends. And on some things, your JVM may fight you if you try and do what seems like the right decision. Another problem that we have is management. And by this, I don't mean our, our bosses. Um, I mean the management of the hardware, keeping track of all that hardware. Because it used to be so easy to keep hardware, to keep track of hardware, you could sort of look at it when it was there or it wasn't. But the, the joy of the cloud is that it makes it so easy to provision hardware. But of course, even though it's in the cloud, It doesn't mean it's free. There is still a physical box somewhere. And not only is it not free, it's not necessarily even useful. And in particular, things on the cloud have a way of staying alive after you forgot about them. And so this sort of this one-click provision and then never deprovision is a bit of a problem. When I was first learning Kubernetes, I did what anybody would do, and I tried it out. So I provisioned an instance, but I had too much work in progress. So I forgot about it. Two months later, I remembered my Kubernetes instance, and I came back to it. And I discovered that I'd done a pretty well-provisioned instance, and you know, Kubernetes does tend to need a lot of hardware. And so it was a 1,000 euros a month for this instance that had just been doing exactly nothing, no, no education, no nothing for the past two months. Um, so when I said management isn't a problem in the cloud in terms of your boss, in that case, it was a slightly awkward conversation with my boss to say, yeah, you know that, that our budget that I just completely spent doing nothing useful at all on Kubernetes, oops. But the thing is, this isn't just me. This is, it's lost. Would like a handheld? I will take a handheld. <laughs> Thank you. So th this is um, a problem that we have, all of us in our industry. They're called zombie servers, and they're absolutely everywhere. So I mentioned, you know, things you need to worry about in 2022, hand washing, etc. Zombies, definitely another thing to worry about in 2022. And we, we can quantify the scale of the problem. So they did a survey in 2017. They looked at 16,000 servers. They found that 25% of them were doing no useful work. And when they tried to figure out what's going on, how did this happen? How could we have 25% of our hardware doing nothing useful? The best explanation they could come up with was, well, perhaps someone forgot to turn them off. Oops. And so this is where we come to the FinOps, <laughs> because FinOps is the art of trying to figure out who in your company forgot to turn off their cloud. How many of you get these emails on, on some sort of regular schedule saying, yeah, we've looked at our cloud bills and we can't really figure out where the spend is coming from, but could you please look at your instances and turn them off because our cloud bill is larger than we'd like? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I get them too. And, and this isn't just a kind of a, like a people keeping themselves busy. This can be really problematic. So th there are companies that have gone out of business because they had a little bit of an accident with their cloud costs. And of course, this is something that could never happen with physical servers. So there was a lovely story a few years ago where a, a, a company, they thought they were on the free tier of Firebase and they, they pushed some code up on a Friday, um, and then they came in on the Monday and they went, why is our Amazon bill $72,000? What happened? Um, and they had an infinite loop, and then it just sort of burst out of the free tier and then just kept growing and growing and used all of that money. And the thing is, this can happen to really experienced developers as well. Um, so normally I ask who knows about Troy Hunt. Um, Troy is speaking tomorrow, so hopefully you all know, know about Troy Hunt. Um, he, you know, he has this amazing service and it hosts 
so there is a cost associated with it, but he cashes to keep that cost under control. And over Christmas, when he had other things on his mind and he had too much work in progress, he realized that his bill had started going up and up and up and up. And by the time he noticed the problem and looked at it, he had $11,000 of hosting costs for this site that he just runs as a, as a public service. And when he looked into it, he discovered that he had it caching, but that there was a config option on the cache to say, if this is a small file, cache it. If this is a large file, don't cache it. I'd really like to take the expense of downloading it every time. Why this config setting exists, I don't know. I can't imagine any scenario in which you want to cache the small things and pay for the big things, but this is, it is what it is. Um, so <laughs> I said, you know, the tuning and the small services by, by instead of big services was the, the chaos, but actually I think maybe, maybe this is the chaos part. And, and we see some other things as well that are still not quite ideal in the cloud. When I, when I started at IBM, we used to release once every two years and the way we released was to press things onto CDs in Ireland. So we had this really strict and very infrequent release schedule. With, with the cloud, with microservices, releasing is, in principle, much less expensive. So we can do it on a much more frequent cadence. But I sometimes think a lot of our processes haven't really caught up to that yet. They are still operating as if releasing is some expensive event that we can only do very, very infrequently. So we need to have as much ceremony as possible in front of every release. And the intention of this is to reduce risk. The actuality of it is it often significantly increases risk. When I was in the IBM garage, we, we talked to um, a bank and they were, you know, sort of a, a large legacy bank and their lunch was getting eaten by the challenger banks. And they could see why. It was because the challenger banks were able to move so much more quickly than them. And so they, they spoke to us and they said, we're, we're moving too slowly. We, we've got this big COBOL estate. We think that's part of our problem. We think we should modernize into microservices. And so we were thinking, mm -hmm, yep, yep, we, we, we can help you with this. And, you know, we were busy starting to write out the large contract. And then they added our release board only meets at twice a year. So at this point, the COBOL is not the problem. The lack of microservices is the problem. The problem is the release board that only meets twice a year because it doesn't matter how many microservices you have, they're still only going to release twice a year. And when we talk about microservices, we sort of, you know, we have modularity as a goal. Modularity has always been a goal. There are lots of ways to achieve modularity. Not all of them involve smearing your application across the internet. So microservices, we, as a consultant, I speak to so many people who say, I, I want to go to microservices, but microservices, they're not a goal. They're a means, and you need to think really hard about, well, what problem am I actually trying to solve? Am I trying to improve my stability? Am I trying to release faster? What, what am I trying to do? And focus on that and then decide what the best solution is. It may be microservices, but honestly, it, it may not be. And when we ask businesses, well, so why, why do you want to do microservices? Trying to get to that, okay, well, what problem are you really trying to solve? They say, Netflix does microservices. Well, I think it, it's, it's a natural human tendency, and I think it's pretty admirable that when we see people doing things really well, we want to we learn from them, we want to emulate them. But I think sometimes we look at the sort of the surface of what they're doing without really understanding the, the underlying factors that they have in place as well. And, and as well, we, our business environment is maybe not Netflix's business environment. And when we, when we want to go to the cloud, we have to, you know, cloud and microservices aren't synonyms. Even cloud native and microservices aren't synonyms. You can be really cloud native without having microservices. And that is, that is okay. And you know, you're still a cool developer if you do that. Because microservices, 
They have a lot of benefits, but they have challenges as well. I was brought into an engagement um, because it was having a lot of problems. And so I arrived and the first thing they said to me was, every time we touch one microservice, all the others break. So they thought they had microservices, but they actually didn't have microservices. They had a distributed monolith. And when I looked into the code, I just found layers and layers and layers and layers of spaghetti. And what was making the spaghetti so much worse is that if you have a monolith and it's all in one IDE, your, your IDE is going to help you avoid the worst problems. You'll get type safety. You'll get compile time checking. And if you, if you call another function, it's going to work. With microservices, if you call another function, it might work. The thing at the other end might be there. It, it might not. It might die halfway through. So you have to do all of this extra work in order to handle that uncertainty. It may be worth it, but you have to think really hard about what problem am I, am I trying to solve? And in this case, when I, when I looked into it and looked at the code, I saw that there was this object model, this domain model that was really complicated. There was about 20 different classes. Some of them had 70 fields. So what they'd done is they'd duplicated it. So in an ideal world, each microservice maps really neatly to a domain. But in this case, you couldn't really say the domain was different for each microservice. So we had this. We had lots of little microservices and one domain. Um, this, by the way, this is bad. Don't do this. If, if your domain model looks like this, you need to rethink your microservice boundaries. And, and there's sort of an assumption, I think, that if you're doing microservices, if you're distributed, then you must be decoupled because they both start with D. And we all know that words that start with the same letter mean the same, no. Um, and we saw all sorts of problems. So often, you know, we sort of see these problems like a lot of them have to do with communication and understanding, you know, oh, we weren't expecting your service to do that. or. Or one team would notice a typo, and so they'd correct the typo in their JSON and be really pleased with themselves for finding the er error, and every other microservice would break. And a lot of these problems could have been fixed by more automation and more testing. So you definitely don't want to be going anywhere in the direction of microservices unless you're really on top of your automation and really on top of your testing. So this is the test pyramid. Um, people argue about exactly what shape it should be and that kind of thing, but I still find it, it's a really useful model for thinking about what kind of testing you should be doing. At the top, you have your end-to-end -end tests. Those are really good in terms of giving you a lot of confidence that your thing actually works. The problem is they're really expensive to write and they're really expensive to run. At the bottom layer, you have your unit tests. You should have a lot more of those because they're so cheap. The downside is they only give you limited confidence. They give you confidence that your little part of the world works. They don't give you any confidence about how, whether it works as part of the broader system. Usually in the middle, we talk about integration tests. Um, but I would suggest instead start thinking about integration tests, but also contract tests. Um, so how many of you use contract testing? Uh, about five hands. Um, how many of you have heard of contract testing? About half, I think. And how many of you have heard of contract testing and have, like um, Open Telemetry, really good intentions to use it someday but haven't quite got around to it? So about, about one or two hands. Um, Hopefully that, uh, that proportion will be slightly higher at, at the end of this, because um, I think contract testing is really useful. And I'm a huge advocate of TDD, and contract testing can also fit really nicely with that kind of TDD flow. It has some of the same sort of principles. And I think a nice way for thinking about what, what contract testing is doing 
is in the context of a fire alarm. So how do you, if you, when you have a fire alarm, how do you know? You, you definitely want that fire alarm to work, but how do you know it works? How do you get confidence that it works? One thing you can do is you can set your house on fire. If as the house burns to the ground, you hear beep, 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 you have a lot of confidence that your fire alarm did its job. But the downside is you don't have a house anymore. So confidence, yes, but the expense is not acceptable. You hope that somewhere the fire alarm company tested the fire alarm this way at least once, but you don't want to be the one who's doing that fire alarm. There's a simpler way that you can test a fire alarm, which is that every fire alarm has a little button on it and you push the button and it goes beep, 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 beep. So this gives you really good confidence that a fire alarm can go beep, 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 beep. But I don't want a device that goes beep, 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 beep when I push a button. I want a device that goes beep, beep, beep when my house is on fire. And fires don't have fingers. So this doesn't necessarily give me the right level of confidence. So there's this sort of mismatch where I've tested one element of the function, but there's a gap. There is a middle ground. Um, and I realized I had this picture and then I realized nobody ever knew what it was. Just hands up anybody who recognized yeah, yeah, about four hands. So, oh, actually, no, more, more hands. Oh, good. So for those of you who don't recognize this, um, sometimes in things like shopping malls you'll, or other institutions, you'll see um, a little service worker going through and they have a long stick. And at the end of the stick is a cup. And they sort of wrap the cup around the fire alarm and then the fire alarm goes beep, beep, beep. And what it's doing is it's a little machine and it sort of emits a puff of smoke in so that you actually get that correlation between smoke makes the fire alarm go beep. So you get that much higher confidence without burning the house down. And this is what contract testing does. You are testing the connection between the two without having to assemble the whole system. So I'm going to do a little demo now, actually. Right, I'm going to have to try and switch back to my... Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right, this is a... <laughs> okay. So what I've got, excellent, is I've got the world's simplest application. When I started writing this demo, I had in mind a really elaborate microservices application with, you know, maybe six services. And then I ran out of time because, because, but so um, what it actually has is it has a Node.js front end and a Java backend. So it is the world's simplest distributed ap application. But I think actually if I had more services, we wouldn't have necessarily learned anything more. So I have on my front end, if I do, I can start it up. And then we should see an application. And you can see this isn't showing very much yet. Um, because I have a front end, but no back end. So if I go to here, and if I do I'm running it on Quarkus. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm starting Quarkus in dev mode and I've got some tests and the exciting thing is that now, yeah, so the, the data model is a resident and the resident moves around the various rooms of the house. So you can see as it moves through each room, its state changes. So when it goes to the kitchen, it gets full. When it's in the bedroom, its eyes goes, go from open to closed and that kind of thing. And so if I look at my class for it, I've got this resident object. And one of the body parts I've called the torso. But torso is actually kind of one of those words that's maybe a little bit too fancy. 
So I think I'd like to rename this to stomach. So if I rename it to stomach, then IntelliJ will help me out. And let me just rename this as well. Cool. And so if I run my tests, so you can see I briefly had a test failure while I was refactoring, but then IntelliJ sorted it out, so all my tests are passing. And so now if I go here, I can rerun. <laughs> But I have a problem. I no longer have a torso. And it's because I changed the method name. And so JAXRS helpfully changed all of the JSON, which means that my node side has a problem. But all my tests are passing. And if I go to the node side, if I run my tests, these tests are passing too. So this is the sort of the ca classic problem where everybody's thing is working perfectly, but the system as a whole just doesn't work. And so this is where contract testing can help. So over here, I've got some tests. So I've got like a test here that's doing stuff, but because it's got that hard-coded expectation about the data model, it's not going to work. So I'm going to bring in a contract test instead. So I've got a very similar test. If you would compare the two, you'd see they're, they're pretty similar. And I'm even sharing the sort of the same basic expectation. But it has a few extra things to say, like the hair could be frizzled or it could be combed, depending whether they were trying to organize a, a microphone or not. You know, the, the stomach could be full or hungry. I don't really care. Either is fine. But, you know, if the stomach is, you know, exploded or something, then then that's a problem. So let me restore this. And then what we should find is that my tests run and they still all pass. But I have a new file, which is, hopefully I have a new file. Where's my new file gone? <laughs> I definitely have a new file. Oh, no, 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 no. So I'm going to copy my contract that got generated here, even though you can't. Ah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So this file is the contract. So it's just a simple JSON file that has those expectations that says, if I go to the slash resident endpoint, I get JSON back. And this is sort of the, a default example. And then here's some extra rules about what, and what is and what isn't acceptable. So I'm going to copy that across to my Java side. Normally, you could do this by copying it, but you're probably not in the same team. So normally, you would either do something like, on the consumer side, checking it into the provider source control, or maybe putting it up to a packed broker. And one thing that's not totally obvious just from seeing that code is that because I had a sample JSON, this is acting as a mock. So packed is acting as a mock, so that on the consumer side, all I, instead of having to hand write a mock, I use packed, tell it what I expect, and I get that mocking for free. On the provider side, if I go back to IntelliJ, and again, if I pull back, I have the contract because it got copied across by hand, but then I'm also going to have my contract test. So let me bring that back. And let me show it you. So this test is pretty small. It's just got a little bit of stuff. Um, again, I'm using Quarkus to stand up the server. That's not necessary. Pact is, is just independent. You can stand up the server however you like. And I'm telling it what port number. But then everything else I'm saying, I just want you to do the Pact verification. 
And so on the provider side, PACT will take that contract and turn it into a functional test. So on the provider side, I'm getting a free functional test from this. And you can see that if I run it, I now have that failure that I was expecting that says this shouldn't be called torso, it should be called stomach. So that gives me the guidance to fix it. So with that, we can go back to that. So thank you very much for the microphone holding. So just to sort of to, to recap, we had, well, actually, no, we don't need to recap because it actually worked. Um, <laughs> you can see why I put that slide in. <laughs> um, I, I really would recommend consumer-driven contract testing as a way of avoiding some of those calamities because it does give something to both sides. So on the consumer side, it gives you a mock so you don't can maybe skip wire mock or, or whatever. On the, on the producer side, it's, a, it's an extra functional test. And then you've got that shared JSON contract that you put somewhere shared to align your expectations. Um, some people try and adopt PACT and they do, they do find it a challenge because they may need to talk. The consumer and the provider may need to talk to each other and there's sort of this idea that like I didn't do microservices to talk to people, I did microservices so I never had to talk to anybody again. I think realistically if you want your system to work, you may need to bring in some communication. So just to sort of to wrap up as a whole, um, even though we've been using cloud for so long, don't assume it's a solved problem. You will still find some things that will bite you. Um, don't assume microservices will solve all your problems. They will solve some problems while giving you lots of new exciting problems, which can be entertaining or not. Um, but contract testing, I think, definitely can solve some of the problems that you brought on yourself by, <laughs> by switching to microservices. Um, and with that, thank you very much. Um, there's a link to the slides and the demo code there. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Enjoy the break.